whoa, this is very seldom that I'm nervous. <laughs> and today I am. <laughs> this is a confession. Um, a really, really special privilege for me uh, to be here. Um, thank you so much, uh, Pastor Paul, for, for the invitation. Thank you to the, uh, the elders as well for, um, for inviting me to come and share with you. I know you have a bigger vision and uh, a bigger purpose uh, why um, I'm here today and we'll, we'll talk more about it. It makes it so much special to be here, yeah? I'll, um, if, you're, if my face isn't familiar to you and you've come uh, to this church regularly, especially during summer breaks when tourists come through. Um, if you think maybe uh, maybe a little bit longer, you will uh, recognize me. When we lived in Invercargill, once a year we would come to Nelson faithfully every single year in all our seven years. I think only with one exception that we couldn't uh, make it but um, Nelson is is the place yeah everybody knows yeah in this room <laughs> that's why you're all here um, and uh, yeah we go back uh, years yeah with um, Wayne and Kim we had so much fun uh, they uh, ministering together they helped us so much with young people it was just a blast uh, to have them and what makes this um, experience for me so special too is to have my boss here, yeah, uh, ex-boss, yeah, but I still consider Pastor Jerry as uh, my mentor. Um, and um, uh, just last uh, this week on Wednesday we had our uh, meeting with the uh, um, regional pastors in North New Zealand. Um, because Derek Morris um, is is there, and he's he was uh, running a couple of just meetings with all of all of the pastors, and I was invited too. I don't belong to the conference staff, but they were so gracious uh, to invite me. And we were chatting, and he had one question. I said, "Who was uh, one of the ministers or one of the mentors that really kind of shaped your your thinking and uh, encouraged you on your journey?" And um, a number of times, Pastor Jerry uh, was mentioned as. as as people uh, share their experiences. Um, I know Pastor Jerry, as being the union president, used to send an email to uh, Craig or other presidents saying, well, I have just maybe five Sabbaths uh, left, but I want to be out there with the churches. And I would be one of the first one to shoot him all back, say, <laughs> log him in, uh, being selfish because uh, Pastor Jerry um, came and he sat and he listened and he really nurtured and uh, really helped me uh, to, to navigate in so many uh, ways. So truly appreciate that. And I know um, Cheryl was behind there uh, uh, with uh, Pastor Jerry supporting. And then we also had the privilege of working with Pastor Jerry for um, a year and a half, yeah, uh, together in, uh, in one office under his leadership. Um, and we miss you, uh, Pastor. And such a, such a pleasure to be here. I want to also thank you for um, embarking on a little challenge um, and assisting me to do my ministry a little bit better. At uh, this stage, my role involves uh, ministry to young people, to families, to children, and even women. So if you haven't seen a male figure who is also a women ministries coordinator, you can look in my face and take even a photograph, and I can autograph that, um, that for you. So it's a very, very exclusive uh, chance that you have, yeah? <laughs> um, but I really appreciate you doing this survey, Let's Talk. And I know um, all of your leaders are involved and extended also leadership or church, church members. Um, we have just put this resource together. It's not even a resource, it's a tool. Assisting churches to engage in a dialogue with young people to ask them what they think about their faith experience. It's all good uh, for us as ministers, as theologians, as pastors or as leaders to sit together and have a committee and discuss youth issues and think why um, uh, young people are now having a challenge to grow uh, spiritually and then come, come up with a verdict, come, come up with a resource and then launch this resource throughout the, the union and the division. 
we decided to go a little bit um, uh, to take a little bit a different journey and actually engage young people in this dialogue and we are asking churches and uh, uh, nine churches throughout our two conferences to be a sample a sample experience uh, or sample churches for us to gauge um, 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 some in insights on how we can improve this tool before we actually launch it for mass uh, publication for uh, for our union so your church agreed thank you so much um, pastor Paul and thank you to you um, leaders as well and I look forward to supporting you um, in your focus groups when you will have maybe in a fortnight um, so we can learn some of those um, some of those things that will um, empower our young people and will also empower us to grow um, and develop better uh, better resources and better tools. How many of you have come across this resource as well? A faith Shaper. I will leave this um, with your pastor and your leaders. Um, this just brings some s issues to the surface. To really, it really gets the church to think about young people and, and how they can minister to them. And this is a solution. It's, it's not a model, but it's a way to really explain how any church can take on uh, a journey of implementing seven components to minister to young people. So they not only stay in church, but they are active ministers, they are active leaders, active disciples of Jesus. Um, why it is important, before, before I now switch to, to my message, have you heard the fact that we lose young people to the world? Do you have an idea how many young people we lose to the world as, as a denomination? Any idea any, in percentage? Pick a number. How many, percent, how many percent of young people leave church, never come back? 70s, here many, many 70s, yeah? Um, can I, oh, before I give you a, a figure, uh, can I give you bad news? We have no idea. <laughs> Isn't it bad? So we, we don't know what we are dealing with because no one ever actually sat down to study it and say, hey, actually, how many are we losing? Does anybody have any kind of data? No. So we assume an anecdotal uh, figure that we can come up with somewhere between 51 to 80 percent. It depends on the church and the area. Now, just think about it. 51 and 80 percent of our young people march through the doors and never come back. What do you think uh, about this challenge? It's pretty, pretty bad, yeah, for um, for um, for any any organization or, or, or any uh, any group. So we would like to, in the first place, we would like to have some kind of understanding and clarity. How many? So that's why we need we need this. And then what are the issues? So we are really um, uh, trying to explore this um, this subject. So I do thank you for assisting me um, in this. My time is running out and we'll uh, switch at the gear and we'll uh, make, make a move forward. This is my beautiful wife, Agnesa. Uh, she sends you the greetings. And when we came here, she, she's always with me because I'm married to only to one uh, wife. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and these are our two boys, Nathan, he's seven, and Daniel is three. They are totally different, and as, as you parents know, um, at times it's just a strange thing that happens. Uh, if I take Nathan to a playground, I need to go as a parent to make sure Nathan is safe. When I take Daniel to a playground, I need to make sure that everybody is safe. <laughs> so, um, totally different kids, and um, it, is, it is really enjoyable to, um, to have them um, in, our, in our family. Now, I, ha I want to start with a question. What is the dearest thing in your life? The dearest thing that you treasure, that gives you the sense of fulfillment, belonging, that kind of warmth, that when you think about it, it's just like, yes, I, I have it, or it's mine. It's just something that really warms your heart. Can you think about one, one thing? Maybe it's your child. Maybe it's your, uh, your grand, grandchild. Maybe it's your spouse. 
I don't know. Can you think about this this one one person, one thing? Does it give you this warm feeling? Does it give you this this kind of um, even pleasure to think about it? You know, I suggest you ask your kids about their dearest thing, and you will have all heaps of uh, laughter and fun. I asked my three-year-old one, um, and I said, Daniel, what's your greatest, the greatest thing that you love so much? Without even thinking, he comes up with an answer. And he says, this is Robson. I'm like, what? And the Robson is just a small little kiwi bird <laughs> that he likes to play with. Now, friends, I don't know about you. I really expected daddy, you know? <laughs> well, I could handle, you know, my mom. But to say Robson, I was totally ripped off any kind of uh, dignity and anything. I said, OK, I better just yeah, <laughs> perform a little bit better yeah, in my um, in my father experience. So uh, what is God's dearest thing? What is, what makes his heart sing? What makes his heart cry? There is only one thing that we know that can break his heart and can also make his heart sing and be joyful. And who is this? It's you, yeah? It's us. Now, can you think about a verse that, sp that you can use to express that gospel message in just one verse? And I know automatically you think John 3.16, yeah? They go, except John 3.16. He's a challenge. <laughs> I knew it was coming, so I, s I kind of exclude that. Some other verse. The apple of the eye really portrays that dearest thing that God uh, has. Any other? It says the gospel message. If you, if you were to, to share with someone the, the depth of this gospel message. Luke 15 and the prodigal son. Yes, the whole story, yeah? Another fabulous uh, story. By the way, uh, is this culturally okay to engage the audience um, here? Yeah? Thank you, Jesus. Um, so I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here, yeah? That's, that's good news. Um, and is this okay if we'll have less, uh, less preaching and more teaching uh, this, this morning, yeah? Someone wise uh, said it before, and I uh, really try to follow it. I, I think we will gain more insight uh, from shared experience and, and shared journey rather than just me telling you what you should know, yeah? So here's my verse. Here's my verse that I, um, um, I really think that portrays and explains this, this gospel message. Um, we will come to this verse in the next slide. John 1.1 1, 1 starts with these words. In the beginning, the word already existed. And the word was with God. And the word was God, God himself. And here is the, the gospel message. So the word became what? Human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness. And we have seen his glory. The glory of the Father's one and only Son. Why do you think I have chosen this verse to explain the gospel message? What does it tell you about God? What does it tell you about the way he went about saving us? What's the gospel message in this verse? Yes, his, his, love, his love never fails, yeah? Unfailing. Wayne? Became human. Became human. Same thing. Yes. No stealing, yeah? Remember the Avon? Even thoughts. Shall not covet brother's thoughts. And here is the explanation. Here's the explanation why it happened. John 1.14, it says, No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who, who is himself God is near to the Father's heart. He has revealed God to us. 
Friends, when the world had no idea who God was, about his true character, that he is unfailing with, with his love and faithfulness, he had to come, friends, he had to come and be like one of us and live with us to actually show this love in action that it doesn't fail it doesn't depend on our on our attitude or on our actions did you realize this that god's love will never change we will never be able to turn away god did i say it right did it come right Absolutely. At times we kind of think that, oh, I better just do something really cool, yeah? So God looks at me with this kind of like affirmation. Good job. Yeah, so His love is unfailing. It doesn't depend on us because He is love. But what really makes me think about this verse as, as the gospel is that He had to live with us to make His dwelling among us us so that we are able to experience and see with our own eyes and experience this kind of love to know not just with our head but also with our heart and, and um, our own personal experience this is the gospel um, in this in this verse now let me um, uh, introduce a challenge how are we as a church going to take this gospel to the world and we will come to look for the answer just in a, in a short while but I want to introduce a challenge as I was growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist Church in a pastor's family also um, being being a pastor's kid um, going attending church I heard a lot of sermons and read a lot of articles read a lot of books and magazines on the fact that the world is so bad and dangerous and evil and that this world is a place that we need to stay away from and that this place is so dangerous that we cannot associate with this world that we need to to stay away and protect our sanity to be holy and to be just so that we are ready when Jesus Christ comes wonderful message but something I believe something in all of the good intentions I think these messages maybe just maybe didn't do the justice because with all the, 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 the good intentions that this message really separated the church from the world further and further and further. And thus the gap between the, um, the world and the church became bigger and bigger and bigger. And um, with all the message it was almost like another brick to the wall, adding to the wall to protect the church from the rest of the world because we need to keep the gospel pure don't we this is our mission I don't I don't um, I don't think so um, can I um, suggest this that the gospel without relationships is powerless can I add to this something else that it is even dangerous that is why God himself came to dwell among us to live because only through the relationships with the world did I say it right because through the relationships with the world he could reach he could show this unfailing love and this unfailing mercy friends I believe that Jesus didn't come to our earth on a mission trip as a God he identified himself with us. He became one of us. Now, are you sensing a little challenge that we're approaching? 
Because I'm thinking now, as we continue to think down this, this, this line, it's going to be hotter and hotter. We'll be now thinking, okay, where is he going with this? How are we going now to take this gospel to the world? Can I share with you uh, one of my favorite, uh, favorite quotes? I'm pretty certain you have read it many times before. Ministry of Healing. Beautiful, beautiful words that explain the gospel in action. Jesus says, Christ, uh, Ellen White says about Jesus' ministry, Christ's method alone will give true success. Alone is very exclusive, don't you think? That word just doesn't, doesn't really, it's a very maybe gross generalization. But for some reason she chose this word, alone. Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. The Savior did what? Mingled with people as one who desired their good. He showed his sympathy for them, ministered to their needs, and won their confidence. Then he bade them, follow me. And they responded. What, stand, what stands out for you in this quote? He desired their good, genuine desire, with no strings attached. It's not like, folks, I'm going to heal everybody who is going to sign up on this program. <laughs> just line up. I'm going to just separate, you know, those who I'm going to heal and those who I'm not. He was just healing, generously. Some people came and thanked him, some never did. Maybe they did later, we, didn't know. we don't know. He fed them. He, he had this genuine desire, and people sensed that, that there was no hidden agenda. <laughs> there was just this unfailing love and mercy coming from his heart. Anything else stands out? Mingled. Now, mingling is, is uh, the challenge that I want to come to as we progress with our um, uh, uh, thinking now. Mingled. Isn't the world a terrible and awful and evil place? Isn't it? Yes, it is. Mingling with the world? Now, interesting, how, how did Jesus mingle with people? Everybody knew that Jesus was hanging out with the sinners. Yeah? Where's the party? Jesus is there. Who's, who's hanging out there? Jesus is with, the, with those people. And that's why he was not accepted amongst the, those people who never attended those parties. Because it was not, not good. According to their own understanding. Can I, um, can I suggest this? Just again, um, going um, further with the idea of mingling. How many of you have come across this little cartoon of the gospel message? Yeah, where we draw the world on one side, just what you see here on the screen, and then God on the other, gap, and, uh, and then what happened? Then there was the cross, yeah? Connecting now the world with, with God. And so because of this gospel message and because of the gospel uh, revealed in Jesus, people could be saved. So this is the, um, the message that we use or, or image, um, image message. I believe something happened. As, as the church went and enjoyed the beauty of, of God and praises, something happened. What do you see on this um, on this image now. I think the church decided to protect the gospel so much. Uh, the purity of the gospel and the purity of the saints that maybe the connection has been lost between the church and the world. The link between the world and the church. And I want to um, question myself and invite you to also think, how often do we spend time to study the topic of 
how to mingle with the world, how to be friends with those uh, people. I think at times we change the gospel commission from go to, well, we'll invite you to come to our service, to our party, rather than follow the great commission when um, Jesus says, go out in the world. He says, um, I, I believe that the essence of Christianity is about building relationships with people in the world for the purpose of leading them to Christ and then excellence in walking with Him. Can I share with you uh, one story that you also know from the gospel? Did you know that every single word that Jesus said and every single miracle and every single story that is written in the Gospels was there and is there for a purpose. So nothing happened accidentally. Yeah, even the storm, even the healing, even the words that he spoke, everything, every single bit. Do you agree with this? So there was a story. One day, Jesus talks to his three disciples, Jim, John, and James, the favorites. And he says, I'm going to take you on a little walk up the hill and we'll leave the, uh, the other nine down here. And you know what happened, yeah? The other nine started debating. How come? This is totally unfair. But they, he takes them up on a hill and the story tells us that he transfigured. He showed his real glory. And Peter expressed what other two maybe thought but never had a chance to share because they were speechless. Peter never had issues yeah, with the uh, <laughs> lack of words. So he comes up with a wonderful, brilliant idea. He says, Jesus, I love being here. I just love bathing in your glory with Moses. And it is, it's really so much fun. So I'm going to cut you a deal. We will build three mansions for you. Don't worry about us. We'll just sleep outside. But as long as you guys are comfortable, we are going to have so much spirit of spiritual fun. So we we're going to stay here. Why don't we do it? Jesus looks at him and he says, Peter, <laughs> I think we have some work to do down there. Do you know what happened as they came down, uh, down the hill? Something happened. It was there again for a purpose. To teach the disciples some amazing lesson. As they came down, they saw that the, the other nine disciples were wrestling with the son who was demon-possessed. In fact, they were wrestling with the demons that possessed the, um, uh, the little boy, and they couldn't. And Jesus comes and rescues the situation, and he sets the young boy free. Now, here is a big lesson for all of those uh, uh, that there was for all of those people. And the same lesson is for us as well. I will share with you just a little quote from, um, from Desire of Ages. Beautiful, um, beautiful um, words. It was an object lesson of redemption. The divine one from the Father's glory stooping to save the lost. It represented also the disciples' mission. Who are the disciples? You and I. We are. Disciples' mission, not alone on the mountain top with Jesus. When we sing hallelujah, when we worship him, when, when it's so beautiful. Uh, um, in hours of spiritual illumination is the life of Christ's servants to be spent. There is work for them down in the plain souls whom satan has enslaved are waiting for the word of faith and prayer to set them free where's the work where's the real work it's out there it's in the world last um weekend i was at uh the one project anyone heard of uh, the one project uh, one or two people and um, uh, Terry Swenson he was presenting and I borrowed the idea because when I was listening I said oh I'm going to preach 
um, the same message um, this coming this coming weekend or next weekend, which is here in, in Nelson. And he asked us to think, um, to say w one sentence and then think about it. And the question was like this, on Sabbath morning, what do we do? What do we do? We go, uh, someone said, we go? We go to church. So let's think about it. On Sabbath morning, I go to church. Can you think about it? Just the whole even phrase, the whole even sentence. I go to church or I'm going to church. What do you think? Is there something wrong with this whole idea going to church or I go to church? Do you, do you sense anything, any incongruence with the, the actual gospel? And I decided to put it in, in images. So this is, okay, um, this is us, and we go to church, yeah, because on Sabbath morning, that's what we do. And then we go to live the rest of the week. We go and commune, yeah, we, we work, we do all those wonderful things. But I believe, and that was the idea that I'm borrowing, that God never intended for his church to be a separate place. We don't go to church because you are his church. Wherever you are, you are his church. And maybe a better image would be like this. This is you. You commune as, 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 as a group of disciples. And yes, you meet once a week to celebrate God and share the stories of your life and experiences that you gain where? in your life with others. And I believe this is what Jesus actually meant when he said, you are the salt of the world. Comes back to the mingling aspect. The salt is no good if it's sitting somewhere in a nice salt shaker. You need to sprinkle it and mix and mingle. And when you rub it in, then your salad is delicious. There's no point in this salt shaker if it sits there and your, del and your food is tasteless. But when you rub it in, when you mingle it with the rest of the substance, then there is taste. And that's what Jesus actually imagined for his church. Not to be here. So don't go to church. Pastor Jerry, he, sorry for, for saying this. <laughs> so don't go to church ye, because you are a church. Wherever you go, that's where the church is. At your work. How do you mingle? And that's the, that's the answer. Because you are there. You are mingling with those people. You'll be talking to them about your experience. You'll be talking um, to them about your spiritual journey and the wonderful things God is doing in your life. And I suppose our challenge as we look, uh, potentially, as we look to the future, maybe next year with, um, I don't know, maybe some of your leaders heard the, the, um, the idea of, of Turning Point or some, some evangelism. Evangelism is not a project. Evangelism is not a, a, a campaign. Remember, I, I said earlier, um, that Jesus didn't come on a mission trip as a God. He mingled. He ministered. And yes, of course, he taught. But we know that he provided a ministry and, um, and support more than he was teaching. Yeah, because um, uh, because that's his, um, that was his ministry. We are called, friends, and this is the challenge that we have. We are called to be in the world, but not to be of the world. Friends, I can be holy when I come to church. <laughs> this is so sweet to sing praises and hallelujahs when I'm in church. But when I go out into the world, I can't just leave church here. Because that's not the church God wants to see. He wants the church to be out there in the heart of the community. 
Jesus said, I'm not asking you that you take them out of the world. He never intended for us to build castles to protect the gospel. Gospel is not there to be protected. Gospel is there to be spread out in the community, just like as, as, as salt, um, as Jesus says, but to keep them safe from the evil one. So our challenge is not to run away from the world as fast as we can, but to be in the world without being off the world. That is, I think, a challenge to, for real spiritual maturity, for those people who really need to, to have Jesus when we are out there, when we are sitting in the office or whatever your work, when you are working as a laborer or whatever you do, that's where you can minister. That's where Jesus is with you, not only here. When you, um, when you praise, uh, praise him. The only way we can take the gospel to the world is by placing ourselves in the world. You may have read nice, maybe, slogans or um, titles of nice articles, yeah? The church is taking the gospel to the world and then wonderful evangelistic campaign is coming, yeah? It's, it's better than nothing, but I believe it's not exactly how Jesus imagined his church taking the gospel to the world. God wants us to be there, to mingle, uh, to, to place ourselves in the world. He says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done, even greater works, because I'm going to be with the Father. So this is how we can put the gospel back into the world, put the cross back in the world, because Jesus says, I'm going. Now this is your turn. And you are going to be right there in the heart of the community, ministering to people selflessly uh, with no strings attached, helping them, uh, and they will see the true love, unfailing love and faithfulness. Now, this is your turn. This is our turn as disciples of Jesus, because he is um, he's going. Can I uh, briefly, I know I'm um, past my time um, already, will you allow me five minutes to share brief, uh, brief stories? Um, Wayne, you may um, know a couple of those people as, as I share. Um, s some stories come from, from Invercargill, some come from um, Christchurch in, um, in Auckland. Um, there was there was one, one girl that um, was gifted in uh, with the singing and um, she was uh, really interested in, um, in a personal development seminar, family conference, so she decided to attend and really got, got interested about the things that she learned. And it was done again for the community, uh, with the church for the community. Um, and so as she, as she attended, she really got so much um, out of it and met so many new, open-minded, really uh, vibrant people that she got interested in other aspects of, of life, such as um, healthy living and also the spiritual aspect. She knew that she was missing uh, something in her life, but she didn't know what it was. So, and as the, as the um, conference went on, uh, it started to really come to her attention that she was never actually fulfilled in her life. She was pursuing all the wrong things. And her spiritual, uh, spiritual ears were opened. And she, she didn't get baptized. She um, continued to attend other um, uh, courses, different courses that the center was offering. Um, and um, then next year, there was another uh, conference. She attended the, this conference as well. She continued. She never got baptized. And that went on for four years. He would be saying, well, this is, this is too long, yeah? We want a weekend, a nice campaign, and a baptism. Because we need to send the report, yeah? We, we spend the money. We, we need to somehow, you know, give the account. We need to show, so show the gain. Well, it took four years for the person to really mature when it comes to the spiritual aspect. And then she, um, 
I was all um, I was already in Auckland. Once I see a phone ringing, um, I say Alice. So oh, uh, what's that about? Answer the phone, and she said. I've been coming and going, coming and going. It's been a journey, but I realized something, and God has been speaking to me over the last two weeks, and I have decided to join the church, get baptized, and give my full commitment to him. And I just want you to know first, like, <laughs> this is my paycheck, yeah. <laughs> and uh, she's now teaching in Southland Adventist School as one of the, uh, one of the uh, teachers. She was a deputy principal in one of the uh, schools there, in one of the leading schools in Invercargill. Uh, changed her job and came and now teaching uh, teaching in our in our school Wayne a, a, a man who comes um, with his wife to a church um, because his wife drags him anybody n- can identify with this experience comes because the the, the wife really makes him uh, come and he comes and he enjoys um, some kind of experience but he realizes that hey in this church we have so many so many um other men that i can und- who i can identify identify with and i can hang out with outside the the the, ch- the realm of church um and do some cars things and and all other cool things and eventually it took him over two years to again mature and get um get baptized and be a committed uh, very active disciple uh, of jesus um, uh, this story uh, um, happened just uh, two months ago, actually over the course of a year, but what happened two months ago just really shook me to the core. I came to church, to Papua Nui Church, to um, again uh, preach and uh, work with the, the uh, leaders. And uh, Sabbath school, I said, okay, I'll go to, to some class there where um, we can discuss things. And um, I come entered the the class and I see Boris is leading the the Sabbath school I'm like ooh this is unusual why because Boris had attended a spiritual conference that we we ran the year before I'm like whoa and I actually didn't know that he had been baptized and he's leading a Bible study and as we are discussing very deep spiritual matters it's kind of like a revelation it just dawned on me that I'm being spiritually fed as a pastor by a person who just last year came to church and he the that Sabbath school was one of the best I've ever attended it was like really and participated such such deep and invo- involving I'm like wow and I at that church I said Boris I'll, I'll put you on the spot come on up I said, this is what true discipleship is all about. Last year, I saw you come to the, the conference. This year, you are leading in, um, in the Sabbath school. And the last one, um, just last, last month, um, I was chatting with a couple who um, uh, came to one of um, churches in um, Auckland Manor Park. And um, after, the, after the conference uh, finished m- one month later, I attended the, the church. And I see this couple driving by, I'm like, oh, I said, are they, are they actually, have they started attending church? And the person um, who was standing with me at the doors said, oh, no, 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 maybe this is their first time. And I'm like, whoa. So I went out and uh, greeted them, and um, we sat through the service together. And then um, during the break, I, um, I asked them, I said, so what's your spiritual experience? Can you tell me? And um, sh- Carol started, she says, I will tell you the truth. 30 years ago, I left church with no intention whatsoever to ever come back. I gave up on, on God completely because that whole thing just messed my life totally. And the same for Greg. We both decided individually before they even uh, got married, ma- met together and got married, that we would never ever consider God at all. But when we came to the conference, it kind of really um, brought, brought to the surface that that spiritual aspect was a missing part in our life. And so we just decided to give another shot and see if it actually can be different. I'm like, whoa, the pressure is on. You, you are here and you are giving this one shot after 30 years. And I'll... Um, 
I can tell you a story after story of those people that completely either had no concept of God at all, absolutely secular what we call them, or those people that had given up on God at all. They come, um, mix and mingle with, with people, and, uh, and actually realize that I am missing this part because they see this unfailing love and grace in uh, people just like them. And they say, oh, I have been missing it. And what I would like to do um, this afternoon, I'd like to expand on the aspect of mingling. How can the church, any church, be part of a community? How um, can any church mix and mingle with the community throughout the whole year? So it's not a program, it's not an event that, that, uh, that you can run, but how you can be part of this community. And of course, what you can offer to this community so you awaken their spiritual interest. And so, when, uh, so they discover that they actually miss something. And it is really as Jesus did. He came to live, to dwell amongst us. So we could see this um, or his um, love that never fails so this afternoon let's discover how can any church do the same thing what Jesus did be in the heart of the community so that um, uh, uh, the community people could see this unfailing love and mercy may God bless you let us pray our Heavenly Father, our Lord, our God, we are so grateful to you for the gift that we have in you, that you came to, to live with us so we could see who you truly are. Lord, we enjoy bathing in your glory. We enjoy seeing your glory and, and learning all these wonderful things about you. And now we ask you, Lord, that you will truly empower us to be just like you. Not to give us your glory so we can boast, but Lord, empower us to shine as you so we can show this beauty to those people that live around us in our communities. We ask you, Lord, that you will show us the ways how we can mix and mingle with, with people, with our friends, so they can learn about you, so they can know you as their personal Savior and Lord. We commit this community, we commit ourselves to you. And we are so privileged, Lord, to be called your children and to be called your disciples. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.